you know, you don't really know who you are or what you are until you put a really big challenge in front of you. Fear is an asset and ally here to help you be magnificent. This crazy, silly, stupid idea to run across the Sahara Desert. You did make it this time, but you said if you didn't make it, you would try again and again. Everybody's connected to nature, connected to music, to their families. And now we're going to build a world that doesn't have racism and war and starving kids. I kept telling myself, run out and just keep smiling. Well, hello there, everybody. Welcome back to The Extra Mile. My name is Gene Gurkoff. It is a beautiful, chilly morning in Boston, Massachusetts. And I'm on Boylston Street at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, where in just a few days, this is where the race will be taking place. And I just finished recording today's interview with a legend. You could not ask for a better person to interview in Boston at the Boston Marathon than Catherine Switzer, who in 1967 became the first woman to run the Boston Marathon as an official registered participant. And there is a moment, a legendary moment in that race where race director Jock Semple saw Catherine running on the course and decided to try to knock her off the course and steal her number. And that moment was caught in a photograph, which is one of the most iconic photos, not just in sports history, but in all of women's history. And it's a moment and a story in that photo that has changed the world. And I am so grateful to Catherine for taking the time to walk with me this morning and to share her story and her wisdom with all of us. She was actually leading a group run and walk with her charity, 261 Fearless. 261, obviously named after the number that she wore in that 1967 race. And it's a movement, it's a charity that is helping to empower women through running around the world. So there's about 100 other people walking and running with, along with us. So you might hear some of that chatter. And uh, just very grateful to Catherine for taking the time to walk with me this morning. Also very grateful to our partners at Aftershocks who invited me up to share this weekend with them. Love working with Aftershocks. They make the bone conduction headphones that you've all seen that transmit sound into your ear, not by going inside your ear, but by resting on your temples and through micro vibrations. That's how they get the sound into your ear. So you can listen to your music. You can listen to this podcast all while maintaining that situational awareness around you for safety. So if you are listening to this podcast, I sure hope that you're wearing your aftershocks. And if you're not, make sure you go check them out at charitymiles.org slash aftershocks. Now, without any further ado, let's turn up your volume and turn on your charity miles and come along for the walk or the run with me and Catherine Switzer in Boston, Massachusetts. Every mile matters. All right, Catherine Switzer, KV Switzer. Can you, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this run today. Fantastic. This is I'm exciting. Glad I'm glad you're meeting everything going on with 261 Fearless. Me it's fantastic. Too. So can you paint a picture for all of the people out there walking or running along with us right now for where we are right now and what's going on? What, what is happening right now? This is crazy. It's a lot of people here. Okay, what's happening is people are really ignited by 261 Fearless. 261 Fearless is named after my old bib number in the Boston Marathon that Jock Semple tried to rip off of me. And they come to me, the 261 Fearless in the face of adversity. And people are relating to that because everybody has been told at one time or the other in your life you're not welcome or you don't belong, which is what Jock Semple was telling me you know, when he was trying to throw me out of the race. So people really related to that. And now we have created a nonprofit that goes around the world encouraging women to come out and run and put one foot in front of the other. It's non-competitive, it's non-judgmental, and we are trying to reach women who are, in a way, fearful of taking that first step. Because we see what running has done for women especially. It's transformational. So, Jean, when you're asking me what's happening here, there are a lot of people here. Everybody is excited about giving back, about um, doing something for somebody else that has changed their own lives. So our campaign this year with 261 Fearless is tell her she can't because we want you to say, hey, I know you can do this. 
I know you can be a part of this and get moving and change your life in a great way. Look at this woman right here in front of me, going along, taking her first steps. She has lost a ton of weight. And I asked her last night, I said, hey, have you started running? She said, no, I, I'm a little nervous about that. She came out this morning before work. She's got to go to work after this. So this is the woman you were telling me. She came to your speech here last year. Right. Took a picture with you. Yep. Came back this year 40 pounds lighter. And showed me the picture. Showed you the picture. It was fantastic. And today she's taking her first running steps Absolutely. right in front of us. Absolutely. I'd love so, you to talk to her. Her name is Priscilla. Priscilla. So there's, just to kind of paint the visual picture, there's probably a hundred or so people with us right now. You know, the listeners might be able to hear the, the chatter. And we are just making a right-hand turn onto Boylston Street. Oh, the big one. The big one. And we are, you know... Right, pretty much right on top of the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Well, this is one of the most exciting moments ever, even in just walking along Boylston Street to see this sacred ground, if you yes, will. it is sacred ground. And can you, I guess, just paint a picture visually for what it looks like now and what did it look like in 1967 when you were running down this stretch? Well, it, right now I'm, I'm seeing... Probably a hundred women, women just go by the finish line, all laughing and colorful and getting ready for the marathon on Monday. Right. And now I'm looking at this gorgeous Boston Marathon, John Hancock, everything been beautiful gold and blue. When I came down this stretch 52 years ago, 1967, it was so bleak, so rainy and freezing cold, it was sleeting. <laughs> I was utterly miserable. You're the original and, Des Linden. And uh, it was it was the worst it was the worst <laughs> race. It was the worst race in Boston history until 2018. <laughs> uh, so they, they got the, the big one last year. But um, the, so the scene couldn't be more different. The scene couldn't be more different. Thank you. I gotta go you know to what, work. Priscilla, I just want to quickly introduce yeah. you to our, our this public is here. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming today. I hope we've impacted your life. You did. Time. Thank you so much Great. for everything. Well, and thank you for inviting me. I'm really grateful. You're welcome. We're happy to see you, Priscilla. Keep putting one foot in front of the other and be fearless. Okay? I will. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you, team. Keep up the great work. There you go. There you go. There's an example. Okay, now there's somebody who never even imagined doing anything like this. And here she is. And you know what? Next year we're going to see her. She's going to be another 20 pounds lighter. Although weight is not the issue. Don't get me wrong. She's trying to lose weight. And um, But she's having a sense of empowerment. And that's, that's what's different. So when I came down that stretch, freezing cold, um, I, it, I was just very happy to finish. But it was almost anticlimactic. Because my uh, kind of epiphany moment in the Boston Marathon came after Jock Semple attacked me. I made my decision to finish. That was that was the changing point so in my life. I've heard you say that. Sorry to jump in. But yeah. I've heard you say that. Before he came out and attacked you, and maybe we should describe for the listeners who don't know what that was, just describe what happened. But before he did that, you did not, you hadn't yet made up your mind to finish? Oh, no, I knew I was going to finish. Absolutely. Okay. There was nothing that was going to stop me. Right. But, but of course, there's a moment when he attacked me. You know, there was this moment of, should, am I supposed to drop out? I mean, have I done something really terrible? And I was also very frightened. You know, he was, he was out of control. And I, I didn't know if maybe I needed to protect myself. But then my boyfriend decked him, <laughs> and it was a done deal. And so, I, you know, absolutely I had to finish. I, I had run 31 miles in practice. There was no doubt in my mind that I could, could do the race. I was there, in fact, not to prove anything, but to celebrate the fact that I'd done this in practice. So wow. my coach had given it to me as a reward. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just to back up and kind of paint the whole picture, for those who don't know, you are the first woman to run as a numbered registrant in the Boston Marathon. And the, the scene that you were just referring to is the iconic scene, which every, everybody has seen this picture, of Jock Semple, who at the time was the race director, trying to knock you off the course and steal your number. And that is like a, you can almost, it's like, that's like a fault line in athletic history, in women's history. It's actually a fault line in women's history, too. I'm glad you yeah. said that. I think we turn here. Right. Um, because it's now one of Time Life's 100 photos that changed the yeah. world. And... 
Hold on. I think what we can do. I think we're right up the middle. It'd be much better. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, that, that photograph is one of Time Life's 100 photos that changed the world. And it's not just because of the sport. It's because of the social movement that it means. It's it's a, a timeline in women's history, but also everybody's history. Running is a social revolution now. There are more women runners in the United States than men, 58%. And that's, that's a social revolution because these women are running to be empowered and they're running because it's transformed their lives, not just because they want to be better athletes. How had running transformed your life before that moment? Totally. So it. Totally. And I tell this story at every speech I give. At 12 years of age, when I was feeling kind of nervous and insecure about going to high school, my dad encouraged me to run a mile a day. And he said, if you ran a mile a day, you'd make the field hockey team in your school. And I did, but it was the mile a day that gave me the sense of victory that nobody could take away from me. Right. And all of us as runners know that if we just get even 20 minutes in of running a day, 10 minutes, you know, we feel Change accomplished. Yeah. We yeah. feel it's like, like a day is victory. okay. A little victory. A little brick in the wall. Yeah. So, you decide, like, when did you decide that you wanted to run the Boston Marathon, and what was that decision like for you? Well, I have to blame my old coach, Arnie Briggs, who was the university mailman who had run the Boston Marathon 15 times. And he was my running buddy, and we ran together every day. And every day we went a little bit further, and every day he told me another Boston Marathon story. So finally, after hearing all of the stories about four times, because 15 is about the number of weeks and months went by, I um, I just was I was snippy with him one night and said, look, you know, let's quit talking about it and run it. And then he said, no woman could possibly run it. So your coach told you that. Yeah. And I said, but you're wrong. There are but six women in history that, you know, have run it. I mean, I came from pioneering stock. Um, so there were six then, women before that. Yeah. I've known about Bobby Gibbs. But, but, and then I told him, because he kept saying no, no, no. And then I told him that Roberta Gibb had run in 66. And he just exploded. He just went in rage. He said, no dame ever ran no marathon. He wouldn't believe it. I said, Arnie, it was in Sports Illustrated. People, he said, does it, fake news, fake news. <laughs> no, he wouldn't, he would, because so many people can't believe when somebody really does something. You know? He, so he really, he really was dug in on it. And you know what it was? Is he was afraid. He was afraid somehow something bad would happen to me and he'd be to blame. That so people really were afraid of, that, the, of oh, the physical damage. That absolutely. Went, and absolutely. there was supposed signs. But it's so crazy to think about that because obviously women endure. Like anybody who's run a marathon knows that it's hard, but it's not the hardest thing in the world. Well, for especially for right? women. Women actually excel at it because we have, you know, a fuel source called fat. <laughs> and uh, we're very, very good at anything that's endurance and stamina. So actually, you know, that's one reason why running is uh, so popular among women. We're, we're actually very good at it. I'm sh obviously. <laughs> but, and obviously you endure so much more. I mean, through, like you said, pioneering family. Like women through history have endured so much more than running a marathon. It's crazy to think that anybody would think that they can't do it. But I didn't know that there were six other women who had run it before. I knew about Bobby Gibbs. But they were unheralded. They were unheralded. And, you know, you can start with the old myth of, of Mel Pomeny back in, um, you know, 1896 in the Olympics. Uh, we, you know, undocumented all the way through Marie de la Drew. But, I mean, for sure, people like uh, Millie Sampson in New Zealand in 1964 okay. ran it. Those are, those so they had run marathons, but not the Boston Marathon. Right. Got it. And then Bobby Gibbs ran the Boston Marathon in 1966. And, and of course, that, that because Boston is so big, it was at the time it was the biggest biggest marathon in the world, right? Most famous out of, outside of the Olympic games. Sure. And so you had you you had seen Bobby Gibbs do it in 1966. And I'd read about it. You'd read yeah. about it, and did that like factor into your decision? You're like, if she can do it, I can do it, type of oh, thing. Oh, I mean, it was it was. I said, oh, it's been done, and you know, so yeah. no big deal. You know what I mean? It's Got possible, it. totally. You so. Know. When you were going out to do it, were you thinking that you were going to... Oh, you're like, oh, it's already been done by a woman. Or were you going out there to prove that it could be done by a woman? No, not at all. I wasn't there to prove anything except that I wanted to run it. I mean, I knew a woman had done it. I knew other women had done it. So it was no big deal. And my coach was the one who insisted I sign up for the race. He said, if you're going to Boston, you have to follow the rules, oh. which is really ironic. And so I said, okay. And he said, you got to fill out the entry form. you got to pay your $2 entry fee. You gotta, <laughs> you've got to get a medical certificate. I've got to get travel permits. You know, part of the Athletic Federation in those days was very complicated and um, labyrinthian. And 
uh, I said, what if it's against the rules for a woman to do it? And we went through the rule book, and there was nothing about gender in the marathon. There's nothing on the entry form. <laughs> and I said to him, I know we're pushing a point. And he said, no, we're not pushing a point. There's nothing that says you can't run. And I said, then why haven't other women done it? And he said, because they're afraid to do it. They don't think they can do it. I'm proud of you. You have to sign up. So I said, okay. And I filled out the entry form, but I signed my name, K.V. Switzer. That was probably the thing that did the deed, you know, right. because they probably thought K was for was a man's and, and did man's you do that to no. hide your gender? No. no, I've been signing my name like that since I was 12 because my dad misspelled my name on my birth certificate, and also oh. I was doing a lot of sports writing, and I wanted to be J.D. Salinger. Oh. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That is great. And so it stuck. And there I was at Syracuse studying journalism and signing my papers, KV Switzer. <laughs> so you come to do the race. Now, you said you didn't have any doubt that you could do it, which I find also interesting just because I had doubt when I did my first marathon if I could do it. That was kind of what I Yeah, was, but you didn't do it in practice. That's right. I didn't do it in practice. Yeah. And you didn't do 31 miles in practice. I definitely did not do 31 miles <laughs> So you get 31 miles under your belt. You, it removes yeah, you a lot the, of doubt. You had the confidence. <laughs> Um, what was the race like? The weather was bad. Terrible. How many runners were in it? Oh, gosh, I keep forgetting. I think 658. Pretty, like a, Maybe 752. I yeah. can never remember. So but it's it not was like the but it was thousands considered, that are there today. Although it was considered huge. Yeah. And I and the race officials are grumbling out loud, saying this is getting out of control. There are too many runners here. Right. What was the crowd like? <laughs> Almost nil, because yeah. it was so freezing cold. They they obviously came out for the elites, but by the right. time I got there, there were, was hardly anybody. Right. And I kept saying, what's all this big fuss about all the great crowds? <laughs> Where are the women at Wellesley? There wasn't even one. <laughs> so when that photo was taken, when Jock Semple, the athletic director, the race director, tried to take you off the course, and that photo was... Oops, don't get hit by the car. Catherine! <laughs> I'm going to get Catherine Switzer run over by a car in Boston. Um... That f moment, what you did was important in itself, but the photo kind of recorded it and made it go viral through history. Had you kind of any idea what that would mean for you and, like, your life going forward? You know, you can't predict, you know, the future that way, but certainly when I saw the photo, and I didn't see it until about midnight that night. Uh -huh. So, I mean, at, up to that point, we just thought it was an odd thing that right. happened, that he was just a guy out of control and a retired race director and right. weird that was strange but we didn't think it was any big deal but when we saw the photographs in the paper at midnight because we were driving back to Syracuse after the race um, I said oh boy things are going to change right. <laughs> and because um, it was it was also a controversial picture the, yeah. the, the, the captions and the headlines were not necessarily great it was like um, women in marathon don't have a lovely leg to stand on Things like that. <laughs> wow, can you, I can't and, even imagine. And one of them was, chivalry is not dead. Wow. Boyfriend bounces official out of race instead. Something like that. So he was the hero. I wasn't the hero. I was the villain. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was, you know, uh, the, this. you go back. When I was writing my book, Marathon Woman, I went back. I kept all the newspapers, and I went back and... And read those, and they were so incredibly sexist. Uh, just is so wild. so amazing to read. At the time, you'd laugh at a headline like that, but then you think, you know, wow, this is kind of the attitude. It's very strange. Now, but I've heard you also say that you found that the men in the running with you were great, that they were welcoming, that they thought it was cool that you were running, but maybe the women in your life or that you knew were perhaps more threatened by it. Yeah, that's really important, too. All the men who ran were very welcoming to, to me and to other women. And, and I, don't think women's, I don't think women's running would be where it is today if it weren't for men. Turn it around? Yeah. I started the video before. Okay, so I think we should turn around. Then. Weren't they, weren't they going to come back to us? I have to be at the end, so I can wait here. or Because, yeah, they're doing a big loop around the common, right? So if I wait here, then uh, I'll pass it. I can just... But if you guys want to go back, uh, we've lost everybody, right? Yeah. It's just us. us. Yeah. It's hard for me. It's probably not going to be too much longer, I think.
Yeah. Don't you think about now we should turn around and head back? Yeah. Yes. I don't care. I whatever so. you want. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Right. Here, then, uh, oh, 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 okay. I'll wait for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll. So, um. Yeah. I don't know. And then. You bet. You bet. Is that okay with you, Rosie? It's really weird. I mean, you can. I would prefer to go back. Okay. Fine. Okay. Okay, uh, so that's an important point, that the girl, women would not be where they are today in running if it hadn't been for the men in the sport. I truly, truly believe that. I mean, just look at, look at basketball. What if the NBA had come forward and said to them, great, we support you, we're going to help make your league happen. Right. I mean, um, instead of being kind of defensive about it, you know. Men were fabulous. And running is different. Men in running are different. What do you think it is? <laughs> I think there's a sensitivity when you run and awareness of the fact that we're making an effort and, and regardless of your age, your size, your your race, your orientation, we don't care. We we are very open and egalitarian. You know, you're running alongside somebody in a race. If if it's a girl and she beats you, you say she's trained harder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're very you're very very welcoming. The road's, why, the road's big enough for all of us. That's why I like to record this podcast on a walk or a run, because I find that when you're moving in the same direction as someone, when you're both breathing at the same pace, you can you almost intuitively realize like the humanity in each other. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly. why you know it's all my best friendships I've made on a run. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's so you much know, different than sitting across the I made, I, made the, I made the commencement speech at Syracuse last year. And I said, you know, four days before the New York City Marathon last year, uh, there was a terrorist attack. Yeah. And, it, and a guy drove a truck into the, the runners on the West Side Highway. Right. And everybody said, oh, Catherine, you can't run the, the New York City Marathon. You can't run. You're going to be, it's dangerous, you know. Blah, blah. I said, you can't. I'm going to be running with 50,000 people. And I don't know the guy on my left. I don't know the woman on my right. I don't know their race, their orientation. And I said, we don't care. I would trust them with my life. I don't even know this guy, and I would trust it with my life. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you run 26 miles together. You really feel like you are trusting somebody with your life because it's hard. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. It's what hooked me. When I did my first marathon, I thought it was going to be one and done, but I just remember standing at the start line with 20,000 other people and just feeling like, wow, this is a club that I want to be a part of forever. Yep. Absolutely. It's amazing. Absolutely. It's amazing. And, uh, and, the, and the sense of spirit carries you. And in those days, and I can see now why Arnie, my little coach, you know, run 15 Bostons every year. He came back to Boston again and again and again because it was the day he was the hero in his own life. And it, it was also the day, obviously, that he had that sense of humanity that he could carry with him all year. Right. It's really phenomenal. So when you did your first marathon, were you hooked? How, how long was it before you ran your next one? Oh, uh, 13 days. 13 days? Yeah, that's a, fun, that's a great story. And, and in fact, it's about, a book is coming out about that. I'll tell you in just a minute. No, but I had, but I had been running um, you know, the, the distance in practice. So, I mean, I, 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 in my training involved doing the full distance in practice a lot. Right. Almost, almost every, at least every month, maybe wow. every week, you know, but sometimes. Okay. All right, but no, here's what happened. Is, is after, um, after Boston... The controversy was enormous. I was uh, expelled from the Athletic Federation for running with men, for running more than a mile and a half, for fraudulently That's entering crazy. the race, for running without a chaperone. Uh, they changed the entry form, said this is a men's only race. Um, I was DQ'd from Boston. I had a funny man came up to me today and he said, did you get a medal? Right. I yeah. say that. Look, nobody got a medal in those days. But the first thirty, Especially the first thirty medal. guys got a medal. That was it. But anyway, um, so my phone rings in my dormitory, and it's a guy who's a, directing a race in Toronto, and he has a thirteen-year-old uh, uh, young girl on his team, who he thinks can set a world record in the marathon, and he's going to put her in the Toronto uh, uh, West York North York Marathon. She's 13? She's 13. And would I and my team, the guys, like to come up and run in the race? And he especially wanted me to be in the race because it would legitimize her being in it. In other words, there'll be another woman in the race, wow. another female in the race. And I said, hey, listen, my feet are still bloody from Boston. Uh, but I thought, 
hey, I have just been expelled from the Athletic Federation. I burned my AAU card. I said, Canada's Canada. calling us. We're, like, we're draft dodgers, baby. And we all piled in the car and we went up there and we kind of yeah. like this, limp, <laughs> limp through this marathon. Uh, and she did. Her this name 13 year old girl. 13 year old girl. Her name is Maureen Wilchin. She's 13. She ran a 315, which was then a world record. She so, ran a 315? Mm hmm. What? And um, she, yeah, very talented young runner. Very small, very skinny. You know, right at that perfect height weight ratio age. And uh, finished the last mile with six minutes. She really cooked it in. What? Yep. And, um, so did you hold that pace with her? Oh no, I didn't run with her oh, at all. You no, no, no. I told the race director. I said I was going to probably finish last because I had, I had bloody feet. I could hardly move. And um, but he, but he invited us, and I was determined to, to keep up, you know, my my uh, my running and be out there and, and make a statement. So uh, there we were. Wow. And if we couldn't run in the United States, we might as well be welcome in Canada. Just 13 days after Boston. Yeah. I have not heard. I've, no, nope, nobody. Heard, very, very, very few people have heard this story. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Now I have to say, kind of, it's funny because obviously so much of your story is about how ridiculous it was that people were afraid of the health risk of a woman running a marathon. But when you said that she was 13 years old, I was like. I was like, isn't that unsafe for a 13 year old well, you know, to run? So, well, we, marathon? we, first of all, you know, she, she wasn't my protege. She was his. Um, we had been invited to a race. We wanted to run. We wanted to, to, um, we'd been kicked out of the Federation. So now we had an opportunity. I wasn't going to turn the opportunity down. Right. Um, a lot of race directors thought it was hilarious. That, that I had been suspended right. and invited me to their races and they'd give me a bib number that said unofficial. Oh, and then nice. when I'd get a trophy, it would be, <laughs> and, hey, now we're going to get Catherine the unofficial fourth place trophy. That's great. <laughs> it's really good. But they, they, they were supportive. I suppose they also wanted the publicity, but right. they were supportive. Um, so that was important. Anyway, no, what happened then is Maureen went on. She uh, represented Canada, I believe, in the first World Cross Country Championships. Uh, she ran for about three more years. Uh -huh. And as, as I predicted then, at 16, she was going to find another life uh -huh. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and other interests. <laughs> and she did. And then she faded sort of from history. Huh. But what, what's also interesting is that at 50, and I often wondered about her, whatever happened to her, yeah. And at about 50, her daughter got an athletic scholarship to the United States, into a college. And so she was down watching her in a cross-country race, and she was running around watching her, and she realized she really missed the running. So she got back into running at 50, and we were reunited when I was 62. She was uh, 55 uh, at a meeting with the Canadian Broadcasting Company. We thought it would be fantastic to reunite us, and we both ran the Toronto Half Marathon together. And um, it was like, for her, it was like Rip Van Winkle woke up wow. to this whole new world of running. And um, so I made a few speeches with her and introduced her to a lot of publics. And now there's a book coming out called Mighty Mo. That's awesome. Yeah. That is such a cool story. It is an amazing story. So, all right, so 13 days later... But women were not, still not allowed in the Boston Marathon for another five years? That's right. Were women allowed in any marathons? Like, did the New York City Marathon have women running in it? They let, they let us run, and they gave us numbers, even though they that supposedly it, we were unofficial. Uh -huh. um, but then in 72, don't forget that the New York City Marathon didn't start until 1971. Right. So, okay. I'm not sure, 70 or 71, but it, it was okay. a late start. Got it. Yeah. I that. Relative to Boston. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. You got to ma imagine, though. See, that itself what I mean, is remarkable. Is, is, I mean, like the London Marathon didn't even start until 1981. Right. And see, the big city itself. marathon, the big city marathon was really invented by Fred LeBeau when, when he invented the New York City Marathon. Right. And especially so in 1976. Did you he, run in that, the first New York City Marathon? No, I didn't. I was. Um, you ran in 74, right? Uh, yes, but I ran in 73. Okay. Um, I ran in 74. I ran in 75. And then in 76, they took it out of the park 
into the streets, oh, and yep. they asked me to do the TV. Oh. <laughs> and so I started a TV career. There you go. Yeah, you became a pretty well-known journalist and sports broadcaster. So how, as you've seen it over the years, what has it been like for you to see the evolution, I guess, not just of women in running, which is obviously huge, but just running in general from a tiny race, you know, 600 people in Boston to 30 or 40,000 people in Boston this week. And also just the way that is it outside of sports affected the way that women are perceived and the way that women perceive themselves. It's, it's actually to see the big city marathon evolve the way it has has been to me a, an explosion of joy because the big city marathons have changed the face of our major cities. It's, we talked earlier about the humanitarian aspect. Um, I think so much more, they make our city so much more human. The crime rate is at yeah. its lowest on Marathon Day in New York City, for instance. Left here? I don't know. This I think we go yeah, down. This is the street. This okay. is the, um, the, uh, the evolution of women is nothing short of, as I said, a social revolution. The women watch other women in a big city marathon, for instance, and they say, wow, she can do it, I can do it. Right. But also, you know, there are organizations like 261 Fearless that are now stepping up and taking women by the hand and showing them that they can put one foot in front of the other and they can be a part of this community on a personal basis as well. So that's very, very, very important. It's, um, it's the belief in yourself that I think has changed so many women's lives. And it's not just because they're running and they feel accomplished. They take that sense of accomplishment to everything, to get a better job, to finish an education, to leave a bad relationship, to be a better mom. And I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, these, um, these women are being role models now for the second generation of kids coming through who, who have seen mommy run every day. You yeah. know, I mean, what a, health, what a health message that is. That's fantastic. So... Yeah, a couple questions that I wanted to ask on that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which one to ask first. But let's. Why don't we just first start with? Because we, we opened up the podcast with talking a little bit about two six one. Can Can you just say what two six one is? Um, and how and when you started it and what it's doing now. Two six one Fearless is a nonprofit charity that reaches out to women around the world using running as a means to empower them. It's also a communication system, a network of women, and an educational system. We aim to change their lives in many positive ways. So running is the most fundamental. Do and you have like chapters around we, the country, around the world? We have, we're operating already in 11 countries, and we are taking it village by village, city by city, country by country, to hold, take the woman by the hand and try to show her how she can become fearless. And it's a, it's a matter of her just taking that first step. As we all know, in anything, taking the first step is the hardest. So that's, that's what we do. And we, have, we do community clubs. And we have a lot of community clubs that are beginning now in the Boston, uh, in the New England area. And we welcome people to reach out and join us, start a club, become a friend, and go to 261fearless.org and get more information. Um, so I can see, I kind of have like a picture of what that might look like in the United States, like kind of like this morning, a bunch of women getting together to go for a run, lifting each other up, non-judgmental, it's not about competing, kind of like a girls on the run for adults. That's exactly what it is, and it's amazing you said that, because we studied girls on the run for our Great design work. model. And so what does that look like in maybe other countries that aren't like the United States? Every country obviously has its own customs and puts its own spin on things. And we have to really appreciate that. And we don't go into a country and tell them what to do. We bring leaders out of the country, train them, and have them go back and, and, and do it their way, if you see what I mean. But it's, it's well, what it looks like is women... women <laughs> Women are alike around the world. I mean, so are men. You see yeah. what I mean? We get together, we work together, we talk together, 
we share our dreams together and fears, um, and it doesn't go further than that day. And that's, that's very important, is, is that they have a sense of safety and community. So I interviewed Des Linden here a few weeks ago for the podcast and had people send in questions that they wanted me to ask her. And my sister actually sent in a question referencing my four-year-old niece who has an older brother. And my sister wanted to know what Des, and so I'm going to ask the question to you too, what would you tell a four-year-old girl who thinks that only boys can be good at sports? First of all, I would smile at her and say, you can do anything and that the world is awaiting your greatness and that maybe he can do things you can't do but you can do things that he can't do and i tell this to grown women you know oh sure you're not sure you're not going to be able to throw as fast or lift as much weight or go as fast, run so as fast as this guy but you can go much further in distance you can run a lot longer for a longer period of time you have more flexibility, you have more balance. It doesn't mean one gender is better than the other. It means we have different attributes that we can bring to the table. And I'm trying now also to use that in, in business. Okay, why are women winning outright ultra races? <laughs> well, we, right. we're just beginning to see what sports maybe is gonna look like in the next 50 years. Who says the Olympic Games isn't going to have a 24-hour run or a three-day race? Well, who says the Olympic Games isn't going to have a relay where three guys are pushing the pace and three women bring the team home? Huh. That <laughs> Come is on. I've so seen, cool. I've seen it happening already in New Zealand, you know, where we have a grand traverse of six people on a team. And they're going over glaciers and over crevasses and through streams, and they're going for six days. The guys are completely brain dead at the end. And the women, always, the women are the ones who can read the compass. <laughs> uh, listen, our biologies are slightly different, but we work really well together. I love men. I mean, I think that there's so much we can do together. And we're just beginning to get to that part in our history, which I think is really a fabulous thing. Running has taught me so much about our relationships. That is so cool. So have I told Gene something he hadn't thought of? You uh, told me a lot of things that I haven't thought of, but just, you know, the idea, I almost had a sense of like, that we've made it. Like there's, you know, there's equal number of women in the race this week as there are with men, just about. Maybe more, maybe more women in, in the race on Monday than men. But you just kind of like lit a light. There's still so much further that we can go. So, so many more opportunities ahead of us that's I, just... well and I think I think that that and men are very men and running are very accepting of this that women have brought an interesting dynamic to the sport and I think that they welcome that oh absolutely my husband is wonderful he, he's 80 and he's been running all his life world class runner right and he said oh my god he said I just love women in the race you know he said they smell wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. All right. Well, we've just kind of made a full, made it back here to the Marriott, and I'm just super grateful that you took the time this morning to, to walk with us and to to share so much with us. I know it's a busy morning for you. You've got a lot of people here that want to get selfies with you and talk to you wow, as well. Wow, that was a long interview. Yeah, it was a long interview, right? That was a long interview. Oh. You're next. You're next. <laughs> that was a long interview. What could you... No, all right. Sorry. It's not that much. We're just wrapping up. We're just wrapping. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's just wrap it up. Catherine, thank you so much for thank joining you, us. Gene. Is there any call to action you'd like to make to our members? Yes, I would really like um, all the women especially listening to go to 261fearless.org, be a friend, think about starting a club, um, and tell her she can. Pass, pass on to every young girl, woman, uh, and, and older woman, and somebody who hasn't taken that first step, that they can have a, a very fun, friendly community uh, and feel a wonderful sense of accomplishment by joining us. Catherine, thank you. Thank you, G. And thanks to all of you out there for walking or running along with us. Every mile matters. <laughs>